Κυρίες και κύριοι, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, είναι με ιδιαίτερη ικανοποίηση που ο Σύλλογος Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου συνεχίζει την καθιέρωση των ετήσιων διαλέξεων εις μνήμη του Κύπριου Αρχιτέκτονα Πάνου Γουλέρμου. Και εκ μέρου του Διοικητικού Συμβουλίου σας καλωσορίζω στη διάλεξη του Ελβεντού Αρχιτέκτονα <coughs> Χριστιαν Κερέζ. Η διάλεξη στηρίζεται από τις εταιρείε Rabel Systems, Grohe και Thanos Epiphanyu Limited, προϊόντα Laufen, των οποίων διευθυντές και εκπροσώπους ευχαριστούμε ιδιαίτερος για τη συνεργασία και την εδώ τους παρουσία. Dear Mr. Christian Gerez, uh, on behalf of the Cyprus Architects Association, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation to participate at Cyprus Architects Association annual lecture. Being the speaker for the annual lecture is a great honor for all of the architects. I'm sure that your lecture will be enlightening and interesting for the audience, providing inspiration. Once more, I thank you for being here with us tonight, and may you have an enjoyable time here in Cyprus. The διάλεξη χαιρετίζει ο Γενικός Γραμματέας του Συλλόγου Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου, κύριος Παναγιώτης Παναγή. Αγαπητέ Παναγιώτη, παρακαλώ πως προσέλθεις στο βήμα για τους χαιρετισμούς σου. Κυρίε και κύριοι, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, σα καλωσορίζω στην ετήσια διάλεξη του Συλλόγου Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου, η οποία διοργανώνεται ει μνήμη του Κύπριου Αρχιτέκτων Αμπάνου Κουλέρμου. Το πρόσωπο προ τιμή του οποίου διοργανώνεται η εκδήλωση, ο Πάνο Κουλέρμο γεννήθηκε στην Αμόχωστο, σπούδασε αρχιτεκτονική στο Πολυτεχνείο του Κεντρικού Λονδίνου και αστικό σχεδιασμό στο Πολυτεχνείο του Μιλάνου. Δούλεψε στο Μιλάνο και την Αθήνα τη δεκαετία του 1990. Το 1973 έω το 1996 ήταν καθηγητή αρχιτεκτονική στο Πανεπιστήμιο τη Νότια Καλιφόρνια, USC, στο Λο Άντζελε, όπου διατέλεσε και κοσμήτωρα τη Σχολή Αρχιτεκτονική. Από το 1996 μέχρι το θάνατό του ήταν καθηγητή αρχιτεκτονική στην Ακαδημία Αρχιτεκτονική του Πανεπιστημίου τη Ιταλική Ελβετία στο Μεντρίσιο. Επαγγελματικά διατηρούσε γραφεία στο Λο Άντζελε, το Μιλάνο, την Αθήνα και τα τελευταία χρόνια στο Λουγκάνο. Δίδαξε και έδωσε πολυάριθμε διαλέξει σε σχολέ στην Ευρώπη και τη Βόρεια Αμερική. Εκθέσει για το έργο του έχουν γίνει στο Λο Άντζελε, τον Πένο Άιρε, το Παρίσι, τη Βενετία, το Μιλάνο, τη Θεσσαλονίκη, την Αθήνα, τη Λευκοσία. Το τεμποριακό έργο του δημιουργού Πάνου Κουλέρμου αποτελεί σημείο αναφορά για την εξέλιξη τη αρχιτεκτονική σκέψη και πράξη που καταφέρνει να ξεφεύγει από τα όρια του Κυπριακού χώρου και είναι για τον λόγο αυτό που οι εκδηλώσει μα αφιερώνονται προ τη μήνυ. Η ετήσια διάλεξη του Συλλόγου Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου φιλοδοξεί να προάγει το διάλογο και ενθαρρύνει την επαφή του αρχιτεκτονικού κόσμου τη Κύπρου με ξένου, καταξιωμένου αρχιτέκτονε που με το έργο και την παρουσία του στον χώρο τη αρχιτεκτονική μπορούν να σταθούν ενώπιον μα, καταθέτοντα εμπειρίε και θέσει που εμπλουτίζουν το διάλογο και αναπτύσσουν του προβληματισμού μα σε σχέση με την αρχιτεκτονική. Με αυτή την έννοια, φιλοδοξούμε η ετήσια διάλεξη του Συλλόγου Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου να αποτελεί τον κορυφαίο θεσμό στο ρεπερτόριο των εκδηλώσεων της αρχιτεκτονικής, πέρα από το επαγγελματικό και παραγωγικό έργο που καθημερινά επιτελείται. Ο Σύλλογος Αρχιτεκτών προσπαθεί σε κάθε περίπτωση να αρθρώνει παρεμβατικό λόγο, διοργανώνοντας εκθέσεις, διαλέξεις, σεμινάρια, ενθαρρύνοντας την προκήρυξη αρχιτεκτονικών διαγωνισμών, προβαίνοντας σε εκδόσεις, συμμετέχοντας σε διεθνή φόρα και διοργανώνοντας γενικότερα εκδηλώσεις που προάγουν το διάλογο. Οι εκδηλώσει στα πλαίσια των αρχιτεκτονικών διαλόγων στοχεύουν επίση την καλώ νοούμενη εποπτεία των εξελίξεων στην αρχιτεκτονική και στην προβολή των νέων τάσεων στον κόσμο. Η αρχιτεκτονική διαχρονικά συνδέει τον πολιτισμό με τι ανάγκε τη κοινωνία των ανθρώπων, αποκτώντα κοινωνικό, πολιτιστικό και πολιτικό περιεχόμενο. Η αρχιτεκτονική πολιτεύεται με τρόπο διαλεκτικό, προτάσει και ιδέε που να ανταποκρίνονται στι ανάγκε του σύγχρονου και του μελλοντικού δημόσιου και ιδιωτικού βίου, συμβάλλοντας δημιουργικά στην αρμονική εξέλιξη των σχέσεων του ανθρώπου με τον συνάνθρωπο, το περιβάλλον, την ιστορία, τον πολιτισμό, την τεχνολογία και το μέλλον του. Είναι γι' αυτό που η αρχιτεκτονική αποτελεί καθρέφτη των κοινωνικών αισθητικών και πολιτιστικών αντιλήψεων της κοινωνίας, την οποία υπηρετεί. Καλείται να ανταποκριθεί στις εκάστοτε σύγχρονες συνθήκες, επαναπροσδιορίζοντας το ρόλο Τη προσεγγίση και τα εργαλεία τη, προκειμένου να παραμένει ο ρυθμιστή στη διαμόρφωση ενό κοινωνικά και πολιτιστικά ευαίσθητου ποιοτικά δομημένου περιβάλλοντο. Εκδηλώσει από καταξιωμένου δημιουργού, όπω τον Κριστιαν Κερέ, 
συμβάλλουν στην καλλιέργεια και διάδοση αυτής της αρχιτεκτονικής παιδείας και μέσω ενός διαλόγου συνδέουν την αρχιτεκτονική με τη ζωή και με την αναζήτηση ποιοτική υπεροχή και ευαισθησίας του ανθρώπου που ζει σε ένα χώρο προσεκτικά επιλεγμένο και δημιουργημένο για τον ίδιο. Αγαπητοί προσκεκλημένοι, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, σας καλωσορίζω στην ετήσια διάλεξη του Συλλόγου Αρχιτεκτώνων Κύπρου και εύχομαι σε όλους μας να αποκομίσουμε χρήσιμα συμπεράσματα για αυτήν. Με την ευκαιρία θα ήθελα να σας διαβεβαιώσω ότι ο Σύλλογος Αρχιτεκτώνων θα συνεχίσει να εργάζεται για τη διοργάνωση παρόμοιων εκδηλώσεων, διευρύνοντας τις ευκαιρίες για ανάπτυξη διαλόγου και επιμόρφωση. Στο σημείο αυτό θα ήθελα να εκφράσω θερμές ευχαριστίες και συγχαρητήρια προς όλους όσους εργάστηκαν για τη διοργάνωση της εκδήλωσης, αλλά και τους χορηγούς της εκδήλωσης Rabel Systems, Grohe και Φάνος Επιφανίου Limited. Σας ευχαριστώ. Dear Mr. Christian Kerez, please take the podium to proceed with your lecture. You know, there's something very difficult with lectures on architecture. The only thing which you don't experience is architecture. I will talk about architecture, I will show some pictures, I will show some drawings, some models, but actually it's all, let's say, illusion. It's only talking about architecture, but it's not architecture itself. For my understanding, architecture is a media, and the only, let's say, architecture that in this moment really exists is this uh, conference hall. And I'm very thankful to be here because it's uh, one of the nicest uh, lectures hall that I have ever been to. Um, a space that, that has very specific qualities and a space that also talks about how it was manufactured, what was the purpose, the intentions, how it was used. It's, it's more a street than a lecture hall, and you can also hear the traffic of the cars passing by. And um, so maybe this background is the only real architectural experience. But nevertheless, I, I guess it's um, maybe also a chance to... Um, Um, okay, where, where, how do we put it? Here? Ah, okay, good. To um, more talk about the ideas or the intention um, behind um, a project than to really let's say, give the illusion that these few pictures and drawings are representing a reality. Um, I, I would like to start with a very common program, a house with two apartments in the suburbs uh, of Zurich. It's, it's a very, let's say, common program. And um, what always kind of interests me in architecture is not to um, go over what already exists, but then rather to show what is there already, maybe hidden. Um, so in this sense, um, not to wipe out the facts of a program, but rather to develop out of the facts uh, a fiction. And um, you could say a house for two families is a house which is separated, like, let's say, some towns are separated into two. Um, and the only instrument you need for this separation is a wall. So if you reduce the entire house to this one singular element, then the wall is not anymore 
something hidden, something vanishing, but it is um, the only present element that makes this division also always um, uh, experience, uh, architectonical um, experience. And the former project you saw was the first presentation to the client and um, these are now all studies we did uh, to find out how should this wall look like. Um, and the floor plans, they change from one level to the other. They start in an informal way, in the basement. Then you have the smallest possible bending that the, fall, uh, that the wall wouldn't fall down. And then you have um, the upper floor, which is kind of drawn in a way that it integrates um, the bathroom. Um, and uh, let's say actual reason why these walls look as they look in the end is how they sit on top of each other. Because a stair goes from one end to the other of the house. So you, you could say that design of this line, the drawing of this floor plan is not something that depends on questions of taste or you know what the client likes and what the architect doesn't like or also like, but it's only by kind of assembling, bringing everything together to one conceptual entity um, that in the end um, the drawing of each floor plan becomes as it becomes. Um, so in this sense, you, you could say it's not a design, you know, the, the walls, they have to be like that. Once you accept the premises that this house is only defined by one singular wall. Um, construction site more or less like uh, the exhibition model and the house itself in the end just the cladding of this raw concrete structure. The folding of a wall also defines the views on each level different from each other. This is, um, let's say, the living room uh, or looking from the dining room through the kitchen to the living room. In the end, all these definitions for me have no relevance. The only thing which I think is interesting is what can an architect propose as a space if it's used for living or dining, who cares? Um, this is the upper floor which now is oriented uh, to the lake of Zurich while the other apartment gives a view um, to the town, to the city center of Zurich. And this, this idea of space is in the end also like um, an attempt to make out of something very restricted of a small program, a small plot, um, something big, endless. Uh, and you see that uh, once you open the door to enter this house, you can look to the end of the house and you can look through all three levels. And this perspective gives a monumental view to an otherwise very modest, simple and uh, small house. And what also interested us is that you always see just one side of the wall. It's not a freestanding wall. You have no chance to see the other side except you go outside and visit um, the neighbor's um, apartment. So um, this staircase is totally the opposite of the first one. Convex becomes conve concave and vice versa. Um, the last house that we did in, in Zurich, um, which was finished uh, 
two years ago um, started, you know, it, first it was called um, Haus Müller, but then we changed uh, the title um, for different reasons. And um, it's actually on a plot where already stands um, a building. And um, again, it's a plot that is very um, restricted. And, and we thought it's nice if we put everything outside in the garden in front of the house that doesn't has to be part of the apartment. So, um, for example, the stair is um, uh, on the right side, the elevator is on the top side, the insulation shaft um, is on the left side. And all the rest is one slab, and this entire slab is the apartment. Some parts are outside, some are inside um, this um, building. And um, the elements that we put there, the dividing walls, they change from one level uh, to the other as the exterior walls um, also change. And maybe the scheme somehow is, is, let's say, very functional. You know, you could say, well, um, there are serving room and served rooms um, as it was um, kind of defined in the 60s. But um, the thing which is um, totally different to that understanding is that these spaces in front of the building are actually an extension of the building itself. So um, the columns continue on the outside. And um, these columns are also crucial um, not only that you have no uh, uh, column inside, but with these beams, um, the slabs, they um, get a totally different scale. Um, if you look, for example, at this um, figure in, in the background, you know, you can imagine that this structure is not only there for uh, uh, reasons of uh, engineering, but is also there to give an otherwise small house uh, a huge monumental um, appearance. And you, you could look at this, let's say, like a table with four legs, and you cut one leg, and because of that, the entire structure has to increase in, in terms of um, scale and proportion. And the facade is just, let's say, like a secondary differentiation between inside and outside. Some of these uh, huge sliding doors, which are nearly six meters, are in between uh, the steel beams. And again, you know, um, besides, uh, let's say, functional descriptions, bedroom, uh, uh, kitchen, whatever, uh, what interested me much more is what is the impression of the space? What is the feeling of the space? How do you experience this space different than in other um, apartment houses? And it could also be that, you know, in, 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 in Zurich where everything is small and modest and kind of distant, uh, it, it was also an attempt to um, propose something totally different, something that is monumental, that is of extroverted, that, that uh, also has a space with unclear boundaries, which is not kind of um, uh, nice and uh, modest. Um, Besides these um, small private houses, we did some uh, competitions in, um, in China. 
Um, of course, we did also competitions in Switzerland, but the reason why I liked much more to work in China is um, that I don't understand China, you know. I know Switzerland, I know what are the expectations, and, and I don't feel free because I know too much about, you know, how decisions are made, what are the expectations, how you have to respect which rule and which you, rule you can totally ignore and um, why a decision is done like this and not like that and so on. Uh, in China, not being able to speak Chinese, not knowing any politicians, you know, total freedom. And um, <coughs> of course we lost all competitions, uh, needless to say, but it was much more fun to lose um, in, in China than in Switzerland. Um, not only because I didn't know how it happened, but also um, because out of this freedom, which is in the, in the end also, let's say, like a, a, a personal perception of a situation, much more than a reality, at least in politics, um, comes a freedom that, that also opens uh, different doors and different possibilities how you can think of a building. Um, like uh, most architects, you know, I always wanted to build a high-rise building. This example you all know. Um, this is a floor plan, not too exciting. Um, every column looks more or less the same. If you look how one column changes from one floor to the other, you, you, you can see that um, there's a huge difference. On left, you have a column on top of the building, on the right, at the bottom, and um, the dimension increases enormously due to the change of, um, let's say, structural condition. This is a diagram. And it basically shows how the weight increases, you know, with each level, the building becomes heavier and heavier, which basically means that in a um, building with 30 stories, um, a column at the bottom has 30 times the weight uh, to, to bear uh, than a column on top. Still, if you look at high-rise buildings, you would say, they all look the same, you know. It looks totally monotonous, while inside the condition changes dramatically. Um, so, so we thought of um, maybe, you know, not changing from one level to the other constantly, but changing four times, you know, like having four tables on top of each other. Um, and instead of changing the dimension uh, to change the amount of columns. So this is a diagram of columns uh, of a building with 30 uh, levels, and these columns are only 20 centimeter. Um, and as you can see, we always add um, during the entire height columns. And because these columns are so thin, thought would be nice to keep that scale throughout the entire building and um, we made the stiffening of the building with tension wires. These tension wires are wrapped around the building like a net. So you don't have in the middle, you know, a heavy, clumsy, column or core, you know, which divides all parts, which cuts the building into pieces, but just an open field, and all the stiffening is on the outside. And what our uh, engineer liked a lot, it's um, also the stiffening through tension wires is much more effective. Um, so, if you imagine you are inside this office building, you would have a different view from 
every level. These are the 30 levels. This is the level on the top. This is the second highest, the third highest. You see that you always see the cables in a different position. So the change doesn't come, let's say, from any artistic intention, you know, to say I paint the building at the bottom, you know, where the earth is brown and then on top blue and then I change slightly from brown to blue. There's no symbolic um, narration behind it. It's pure necessity why the look of the building has to change. It's just the consequence um, of a um, structural decision. And moving upwards, you can see that the density of structural element changes and also, for example, the height of the beams, the number of beams changes on top. You have very few columns, so the beams become extremely heavy because you just have a small number of them. Um, the interior would be free for use. You could use it however you want. Um, you can see in this building to all four sides. You don't have the obstacle um, of a core in the middle. And um, every floor plan could look differently. And even in the section, you can imagine that the slabs are a secondary infill which can easily be removed or changed from one level to the other. And let's say, um, you know, in, in China there is maybe, let's say, like a desire for iconic buildings. I don't know exactly what is an iconic building, but I think a building could be, you know, interesting if it changes the reason how it looks. But if the facade or the elements of a facade is just something which is added, you know, which is a purely decorative element, a building is never iconic because uh, even historical buildings or uh, our nouveau building are working with let's say, ornamental or decorative uh, facade elements. But this is a building that is maybe different because it shows something which is existing in every singular high-rise building, but so far uh, was never set free, was never revealed. Um, <clears throat> so far, the last competition we uh, did in, in China was a competition with a, um, a program of uh, 230,000 square meters um, with uh, shopping, parking, uh, five different subway stations, a park and three museums. And at the beginning of, of this competition, um, there, there was, let's say, like the desire not to build an object, not to build a house as an as a object, um, but much more to build a space in a city. And I was wondering how could a public space uh, look like? And I asked my Chinese collaborators, what is the nicest or the most popular Chinese public space that you know, and they showed me this picture. Um, and what I liked about it is that it's a space that is not like a Italian plaza, you know, just a kind of a frame and uh, totally open to the sky, but it also has a, a ceiling. It's like an interior space. Um, it's, it's not anymore, the public space is not anymore an exterior space. And, and this I, I thought is, is, could be very interesting also uh, if you imagine 
to build on a plot like that, um, where I always wonder, you know, what 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 does people attract to visit this uh, town? And you have to imagine that uh, Guangzhou has nine million tourists every year. Uh, this is the same amount as Paris. But of course, they don't come from all over the world, but mainly from uh, the Pearl River Delta. Um, so the, the whole project started with um, the question, how can a building relate to environment, to, to the landscape? Um, how could you create a space um, with a building? So not the building itself is, you know, the, the important thing, but actually the, the landscape and the building should be just a part of this um, landscape garden. Um, so that it is not any more clear, you know, what is massive, what is hollow, um, uh, what is interior, what is exterior. Um, this is a mountain, obviously, but then it becomes like an interior setting and not anymore, as you imagine, a, a mountain as an object. Um, and, and maybe, I'd say, these models look um, a bit absurd or, or look just like um, fantasy. But um, I will show you the interior space of this model here. This is the model, it's big like that. And this was, you know, the vision how this public space could look like. A space where people could meet, where people could also enter without paying a ticket, um, where there are some landscape elements, some um, large-scale art uh, works, and another series uh, worked with other organic um, forms, uh, which were uh, shells combined in different ways. Uh, and here again, we will focus on this model on the top. And this is a picture inside that model, just a collage. We added um, a river and um, an artwork, some people, a texture uh, on the plaster. And again, you know, this is architecture. It's not a vision. It's, it's not um, a collage. Uh, it, is, it is actually what we also submitted in the end. And if you look at the people in the background, you see that the scale actually comes from this uh, one to uh, 500 uh, model. And also the way how you can look from one space to the other um, and only then uh, go outside um, the park. The exterior is also composed of fragments of spheres, uh, like the interior. I would say this is the only very realistic project we, we did in China, because if you control 20% of the project, which is what is possible, um, the self-supporting and hanging shells, then you can control the, the entire building. And all the rest is maybe more a curatorial um, decision. Um, is how the building looked outside. Uh, so the art museum uh, on the left, the city museum on, on the right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I also imagine um, it's nice if the architecture is important in, in a museum, not only the content that the museum is only built for people that are maybe not interested in art, but they still would enjoy to go there. These are all free museums, um, how they work together, how they open in a different way, a 
public space. And um, what, is, what is a museum? Maybe artworks are not so important. I would say in every museum. Um, maybe a museum you could also imagine as a place where you just go to enjoy yourself, to meet other people. And um, part of the people are interested in um, calligraphy from Pearl River Delta area, uh, from the post-war uh, period, because this is what will be shown there. Extremely, you know, specialized. Um, but maybe also too specialized to, to be the, the main purpose um, of the building. So the um, lobby, in this sense, is much more a space that kind of relates to uh, a workers' club from the 20s or 30s from a communist um, country, um, a place uh, for the education and entertainment simultaneously of the masses, not just of a few selected uh, individuals. Um, inside this lobby, the spheres uh, which are entirely built uh, are the sky bar uh, and the restaurant. Anyway, this was also um, a lost competition. Yeah, I, I always wanted, I admit it, you know, I always wanted to build something really big. And then, then came this, this uh, one competition that we won, and this was for the Swiss Pavilion to do something for the Biennale. And I will show it afterwards, but we showed basically um, at the Venice Biennale two projects, and I will show both. Uh, one was a project uh, for the extension of a favela in Sao Paulo. And you can see here, it has a very long story, you know, over, um, over seven years with some interruptions. Um, and um, yeah, the Biennale last year reporting from the front was supposed to talk about our time and um, our times, you know, have some problems, and I always think, thanks God, you know, maybe this is a perfect reason why architecture today has to look different than what it looked 20 or 40 years ago. If you visited the Biennale, you would say, well, it's all still looking the same, but there's a different reason now why it still looks like that. Um, and. Um, It's also a question, what do you show from the front? And, and we actually made two contributions. Uh, one was um, reporting from the front uh, in, in Sao Paulo, but it was also showing all the difficulties we had with this project and what happened uh, with the project. So it was not a success story, but let's say in my understanding, architecture is more about finding out things or kind of developing things than really changing the world to become a much better place. I, I wish architects would be that influential that they could change the world. But I think mainly architecture is a discipline and the most important question is what can you reveal and experience within this discipline? Um, we will ask it to, to kind of make an upgrading for a favela. And um, I don't know why does a favela need any upgrading? I mean, you could compare the two and say, yeah, I like more white 
than red, so I prefer the picture at the bottom. But you could also say, well, this has a much higher floor area ratio, uh, 1.7 and this only 1.3, so this is much more efficient. The example on top is cheaper, it's changing faster, there are much more people living there. So actually it has a lot of advantages. And therefore we um, made a proposal not to introduce new spaces to the favela, but just to increase the density. It looks very easy on the picture, but it turned out to be um, extremely difficult or even impossible. Um, after a first uh, visit um, on the site. And um, I, I have the utmost respect, you know, for, for the favela. And, and I, I was also touched by, by the beauty of the favela. I mean, it's, it's um, I, I don't know, I wish this would be a project of mine, you know. It's, um, it's fantastic, I, I, I never could design something like this, but, um, and, and I was also impressed by the scale of the spaces. What is so different? What is bad about the favela? You know, it's just a village, um, a city, and the spaces are extremely small, atomized nearly. Um, this is the garden. Um, a house that is fallen down, no roof anymore, but somebody then used it with plenty of imagination um, as a garden. So our project was much more done with the intention to, to pay respect, to, to make something like an homage uh, uh, to the favela, and um, what we proposed is actually instead of changing the favela, to extend the favela. Um, this is the very first project. Um, some of these houses are nearly touching each other. There's a difference of 40 centimeters between them. This public space dramatically changes between little squares and alleys. And this whole attitude um, is not new. This is from a publication from John Turner from the 60s. And you see on top um, a favela and at the bottom um, a housing, social housing by a South American dictatorship. Um, and it's easy to see, you know, which has the higher quality. Uh, to live. Um, a very similar picture from a book that you probably all know, Architecture Without Architects. And maybe this also brings me to another project, uh, which was a research by a PhD students on the favela, um, looking at it not as an informal settlement, but as a city which is maybe difficult to understand, which has its own rules, typologies, and morphologies. Uh, for example, attempt to say, well, there's a very specific typology where you have direct access from the street through other buildings to your own house. How would these houses look like? Um, and um, Hugo Mesquita, um, went to several thousand houses and he measured them all, including the furniture, the way uh, how people live there, and uh, finally made these plans. And uh, what is very interesting is um, the favela suddenly looks very rigorous. It doesn't look anymore informal. And in the end, it's maybe more the perspective, the respect for the favela itself, which um, 
changes uh, this uh, view. Um, we did also some trials, you know, to think about the uh, exterior space, how we could look at it as a pattern, but in the end we came back to this very first idea um, to just have um, uh, exterior space constantly changing, um, being used in different ways, uh, privately, publicly, um, a change between alley and square, and um, could be also an imitation of a favela or a pure kitsch project. But in, in the end, um, the project is extremely simple. There are only five different houses, and each of these houses is um, repeated 90 times. So the modules of this favela are extremely rational, extremely um, basic, and the way how they arranged is the only thing that constantly changes uh, from one place uh, to the other and creates an exterior space which has labyrinthic qualities which changes um, constantly. Um, we um, received a building permit a couple of years ago. Just last year, um, the city of Sao Paulo bought the plot, so there's still hope uh, for this project. But meanwhile, the people for which we built, or for which we hope to build um, uh, this uh, project, they organized themselves um, in this settlement which you can see here. And it's extremely rigorous, extremely economical. You know, there are some common spaces uh, with TV or with a coffee machine. And then all the other spaces are tents or wooden um, houses uh, where people uh, would have their privacy or, or sleep. Um, and the uh, Exhibition itself was not kind of just showing the project, but much more showing the process, how we worked on it. Um, and in this sense, it was not really an exhibition. It was much more a work on our own archive in the office and um, in the end showing this archive in a public space. What was for me surprising is, you know, it's not, it's not a show. It's not a kind of a scenography. It's just exposing the material. Even the tables were not designed by ourselves, but just um, from a local university. Is that in the end um, that the visitors are smart enough to read plans and to look at drawings also without uh, too much uh, technical effort. Um, it's always a question, you know, if you lose so many projects and competitions, what comes out of it? And, and I think in the end, the only thing that matters is what is the change of your own awareness? Where does a project bring you? Because from there you can start and uh, do the next project. So the house Okamura would never have been possible without the experience of the favela. It is um, a house that is composed only of circular spaces. It is a house that is not anymore like the previous houses that I showed you, open. Every space is actually part of one space, um, but on the contrary, you know, uh, uh, a multitude of autonomous uh, spaces connected with each other. But in the end, the intention to create something that goes beyond a limited uh, boundary is the same. 
If you look on this picture, you see that you can look to other circular spaces and there are no doors in between these spaces. Um, this is a diagram showing all the different perspectives uh, which you would have. So in the end, each space is, let's say, directly connected to a figure um, of spaces which would change from one level to the other. Um, and this project uh, uh, will be built uh, this year. We are now working uh, on the tender drawings. Um, these are diagrams uh, showing the three different apartments. And if you look um, at this and you see um, how actually the favela project uh, was built, you know, we first had this different units, combination of um, houses which were assembled in different ways to create um, this infinite variation of exterior spaces. You see how closely these projects are linked to each other, even if in terms of program and site or um, space, uh, they are totally different. But in the way how to experience a space, they're very close. This is, you know, um, how we work uh, in the office. Um, a lot of one-to-one uh, -one models. Um, for example, all the spaces in between the circles, they are all kind of built uh, as mock-ups because uh, these spaces are so narrow uh, that we really had to uh, find out uh, if they still are uh, usable. Okay, so um, the only uh, competition, you know, that, that was lately won or, and built also. We won several competitions but uh, couldn't build them. And it was exactly what I didn't want, you know, a small project. And, but then I thought actually small project could be exactly what I was looking for with the big projects, something very complex. Um, and we started to think that it would be nice at the Biennale for architecture to show architecture, to show a space, a space which you could enter, which you can walk around, which you could go outside again, but the space, that the exhibition doesn't show models, drawings, videos, whatever, on architecture, but the exhibition itself is architecture. And what could this space be, you know? And we thought it's absolutely crucial that this space is not representing anything, that it's not a symbol, that it's not a propagandistic act, that, that it doesn't tell you, well, actually, it's meant to be somewhere else, you know? I mean, what is an airport for drones, which is supposed to be in Africa, but then it stands in Venice, which is supposed to be for drones, but then it's visited only by architects and architectural students. So we thought very much, you know, this space is only about having the experience about this space and nothing else. So it could be a space like that, for example. This was the first model that I liked in a period of two months uh, research. And it was one week before handing in uh, the competition. You just need a scale. And then it's architecture. So um, there was a whole series of um, different elements that we casted in plaster. Uh, with the time, we used um, elements that don't have a form as such, you know, like dust, sugar, bags. 
the whole um, architectural studio looked more like a kitchen or like a laboratory than like a design studio. All these paths um, were for a project which was in the end called incidental space. But of course, if you imagine that we built over 200 um, models, it's everything but incidental what we built in the end. On the left hand, uh, you can see the models. On the right, you see the textures, the ornaments, um, the shapes that go with it, um, which was also the process carried further uh, at the ETH. You have pictures one-to-one -one and the models in the foreground. And in the end, the exhibition was more or less the same. You had a wallpaper room showing um, renderings and pictures uh, from the model, not from the actual space, and then later on showing the real space. And if you look at um, this picture, it's actually a rendering. And um, what is here in the red frame, you can see uh, on this picture. So. Um, there was a scan, a three-dimensional scan uh, of the model, and this was in the end what was later on printed or uh, molded um, as um, a form for a, a concrete shell. Um, <clears throat> This is a picture of a model. It's a bit slow, the connection. This is a picture of a rendering. And this is the concrete shell. How it was transported to Venice and prefabricated in Switzerland. So in the end, these are all the same. And there, there is not any drawing in the entire project. Um, the model itself had to be cut into pieces that it was possible to make a scan of each small part. Um, and normally, renderings are like used to sell a project. In our case, the render was really what was in the end uh, built. And it was much more a construction drawing. This, by the way, is also construction drawing. If you look at the outer line, um, it is a shell structure which is only two centimeters. Um, normally, we build like that, you know, slabs quite thick. Otherwise, it would not hold. But you could also imagine a third way, how to reach something stable. And every paper that you take, no matter how you uh, scramble it, you know, it will be stiff in the end. Because all these breaking points of the surface, they work like a beam. And this is the structural system of the incidental space, which also allowed us to have a skin of only two centimeters for the entire building, which, is, which spans over 10 meters and is um, over five meters high. It's very hard to tell um, how the model was done, but only here you see a, a screw. Um, these are the different parts. Some of them were done in foam. Um, it's very difficult to, to know, you know, to produce this piece into uh, four months. So some parts were done at the school, at 
the ETH, uh, some parts uh, were then cast into concrete, um, 3D printed pieces. It's actually quite easy to build, as you can see. So this is the first layer of fiber concrete. And the first layer is only to capture um, every information of the mould. Okay. And this is the last layer with the fibers. It is somehow, you know, amazing that there is so much research in uh, digital fabrication and I had absolutely no idea of digital fabrication. It was just something we needed, you know, to follow an idea. But in the end, we were the first one to ever build an entire space in purely digital uh, way. Here you see the assembly of the different pieces, how the space in the end um, looked like from outside, where the surface is uh, much rougher. And we, we thought it's, you know, it's more interesting if we do something which we don't understand. And maybe people that visit it find a reason why it looks like this or like that. For example, we had one visitor from Greece and he said, in the interior space, it looks like um, the day before God created the earth. Only energy and mass in a total chaos. This, this was my favorite, you know, um, description of this project. Um, this is Patrick Schumacher. Um, he hated the project. I tried to explain him that this is how nowadays digital projects should look like. Yes, it, you know, it's, today it's possible to have an enormous amount of storage on the computer. So this project would not have been possible 20 years ago. 20 years ago, um, you had to kind of design something on the computer. The, the computer had the capacity, you know, to kind of make the bookkeeping of the data. But now that storage became so cheap and available, you can also make more complex forms like this. Wang Shu reminded him of Chinese monks in caverns and things like that. Um, Sejima, I think she liked it. And but in the end, you know, it is not about entertainment. It's, it's really an architectural project. And, and the project was in, in many sense always over the budget, you know, in terms of schedule, in terms of budget, in terms of visibility and so on. But the biggest fear I always had when I worked on this project is how will it be in the end? You know, what will be the experience of this space? Because the space is very small. So I thought maybe it looks a bit ridiculous, you know, to make such an effort for such a small space. Or maybe it looks too pretentious, you know, that you look, oh, interesting, this is possible nowadays with digital fabrication. But in the end, the intention was to create infinite space on a very limited exterior, on a very small um, surface. And in, in this sense, it's, it's 
much more for me, let's say, um, related to a building by Borromini um, than to a cavern. Because it's with artificial means, with architectural possibilities, trying to create an endless impression on a very limited uh, frame. And only this, in the end, makes this huge effort from the initial model to the final um, building uh, worthwhile. Thanks a lot. Ευχαριστούμε τον Κριστιαν Κερές για τη διάλεξή του. Θα δοθεί ο λόγος στο κοινό για ε, να υποβληθούν τύχον ερωτήσεις. Yes. Uh, good evening. Your work uh, looks quite uh, monolithic, almost uh, single uh, dimensional. Uh, maybe it's uh, incidental, I don't know. Would you consider a few more materials uh, to, to be used? Or in, um, is it that bad to paint part of the wall in the single wall house? Or is it part of the architecture that you are uh, uh, doing uh, this well, way? Yeah. I'm not sure if I understood um, the question, but I, I think that architecture is always about architecture. No matter what is the brief, no matter what is the site, uh, no matter what is the program, and that this is in the end about the question, how can you imagine a space? How can you build a space? How can you experience a space? And this interest goes beyond any, let's say, personal preferences. You could also say that these projects don't fit together very well. You know, the, Parisopolis project, the incidental space, they nearly seemed uh, totally opposite to each other. So you could say it's nearly schizophrenic, you know, to show both projects at the same place um, in, in the same exhibition. But also the favela project in the end is not, you know, about, let's say, a political or sociological approach towards architecture. It's about the spatial quality of the favela and how can you create that and intensify that and make that more beautiful um, as an experience of space in a new project. In the end, it's always about this experience of space. So in this sense, also the favela project is, let's say, as autonomous as the incidental pro, uh, space uh, project. Yeah, to, maybe we, I, I could refer to our discussion in the car this morning, you know, we, we discussed um, about competitions. What is the most important thing in competitions? And I think it is the public debate, you know, more important than any decision by a professional jury 
is the debate that comes later. Because then architecture has the chance to become again something which has a public awareness. And it doesn't matter, you know, if it's a nice, pleasant or unpleasant <laughs> debate. And this well, was not a question. If I, if Sorry I may, about that. If I may, if I may make, make myself clearer, when Su Fujimoto came here, everything was white. Yes. Just absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. Even the door handle was white. I mean, uh, changing um, an element on, your, on a project of yours, not the favela, but let's say the a house or just a house, and, uh, and making it something else than concrete, could that be a problem? Well, the house Okamura uh, is built in brick. Um, and um, I would say also fiber concrete is nearly something different than concrete, you know, because it's white, because it's abstract. Um, then steel is also quite important in some projects. I basically like all materials. I could also build with shit, you know, but Every material has a, you know, very special possibilities to define a space. For example, the, the, the house with a missing column, you know, the, the first thing which I proposed to the client um, was because it was standing very close to another house which I built in concrete, um, I proposed to build it in mud. But then the client didn't like it, you know. It's, it's a bit difficult if you did some houses and people come to you and say, oh, I like your concrete. Please, you know, use it again. But I personally, I would say I hate everything I did once, you know, to, to be, you know, to have the possibility to do something differently than what I did already. So even if projects look, but they don't look so similar. I mean, they are all rigorous, you know. That's true, but in totally different way. Not in a formal way. But I also like white buildings. But black buildings are also okay. Yes? Okay. Um, hello, and thank you for the lecture. I just have a um, bit of a different question, like from the beginning, the different projects that you explained. Uh, you had a very specific explanation, reason, aim, and easy to explain. And what I found quite interesting, how the last project, you, you ended up saying that for two months you were doing different experiments, and at the end, like a week before the submission, you found a model that you really liked. I would like you to elaborate a little bit more because it's a totally new language. Yeah, so it's a new vocabulary, new experiments, um, going totally from the model kind of casting experiments. But it doesn't have any of the other aims you were really uh, specific about. So could you tell us a little bit more what were the things that came out of this new kind of investigation? How does it link with your aims? Like what were the things that you discovered, if you discovered any new kind of elements that you thought that became an architectural uh, vocabulary? Mm. Well, I will put it like that. The last project also deals about an idea, or it also deals about a reason why it looks like that and not otherwise. But this is more kind of um, somehow negative. You know, I wanted to do something which I don't understand myself. Because if I understand what I do, I can explain it, and then it po becomes propagandistic, you know? Then it's, please look here, this is um, the space that you can enter, and it stands for the future, it's transparent, it's oval, it's new, it's light, it's very ecological, what have you, you know? I wanted much more a space which I don't understand. So maybe people would go inside and say, what the hell is that, you know? Or 
is this still architecture or is this a project from Christian Keretz or you know what is it and and exactly because it was the Venice Biennale you know and and this was a research this was not just a desire you know and whatever you do in the end you do it you know somehow with full awareness so whatever you know object you have you can look at it and say ah yeah it's transparent because it's this material and it's round because you you can hold it like this and so on so the whole research was how to kind of break that and um, uh, to not be propagandistic to to have something which is only a physical reality you know that you can enter walk around go inside outside and I would say the only architectural intention is to, to find the complexity, let's say, which I was dreaming about in China and couldn't, you know, build there and thought maybe I can reinvent the complexity also in a very small Swiss scale. I don't know if it's rational. Yes. How to how did you decide to do that project? And also about the favela, was it going to be demolished and new housing was going to be built because you talked about the people there organizing the, themselves. Mm. So that wasn't very clear for me and I would like no more. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, initially the idea was to change the favela, to make an upgrading project. But we um, uh, thought that it's nicer to expand the favela, to make it bigger. And in the end, um, the city of Sao Paulo, Seabi, that is um, running all these projects, or was running all these projects, um, they like that this is like an uh, alternative to social housing as it is built um, nowadays, which is rather modernistic, anonymous, um, uh, you know, let's say modest uh, apartment blocks, but not any specific, uh, not about any specific lifestyle. And the people from the favela, they always supported this project very strongly because they, they they were also really you know when I first presented they thought uh, how terrible you know uh, a Swiss architect telling us what to do how how um, arrogant you know and how did you get the interest to actually do this project was it invited well I I, um, I was invited to workshop and then made a presentation uh, in the favela and um, I, I said I'm basically here to learn from you my goal is to build a favela in Switzerland it's not to kind of um, change your own way of living because you know better how to live than me so um, and and this was a good starting point to to also get along with the project and get along uh, with the people. Yes? Um, you said that uh, you don't really know uh, what you are aiming for in, in a design. You uh, tr what, try to explore things, but I personally see a correlation between your explorations in favela and the explorations of void and solid in your castings. And there is a digital, uh, not only fabrication, but design agenda uh, in academics about yeah. this. And, it's very, and I wanted to ask you, how do you situate your work uh, as a practice, you know, the buildings that are actually built, and um, you see this clarity of structuralism, you know, how do you situate your work uh, in, the, in, the, in the 
let's say, theoretical uh, agenda of structuralism. And mm. because mm. You, you aim for this poetry that... Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, both projects are also about, let's say, um, incidents or also the favela, you know, why are all these spaces different? What is the rule? And um, it took quite a while to say there is actually no rule. There are these uh, identical houses, but how they are arranged, you know, is, um, is, is a personal decision, you know. It's, it's not um, kind of driven by, by, by any master plan. It's the opposite, you know, of, of any order. So, so the, the, the kind of richness of the public space comes uh, from, let's say, these random decisions. And this is, is closely related to uh, the project at the Venice Biennale, the, uh, the other one. And this is a shift of interest to the first project I showed, which is always about, let's say, um, a kind of a very clear, strict, um, um, but, but somehow they, they belong to each other because I think both are driven by the desire for to create something that, that is endless, you know, or to create something that, that has no clear boundaries. And, and maybe the, the first um, villas which I showed, the, the glass is, let's say, like kind of um, uh, breaking a, a clear notion of a borderline of a space, while later on it's more the combination of forms and uh, 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 volumes, uh, even if, if the volumes are totally closed. Your project in um, the museum project in uh, China, the competition uh, project, uh, had something very, I think, very utopian and very visionary. Maybe it's the scale of it, um, the, the way the light comes in. It actually reminded me something um, between Piranesi's prisons and uh, Boulet. Um, at the same time, the last project, the Biennale project, in some ways um, is completely different. There are no geometrical shapes, but um, I find some uh, similarity with the first, with, with this, uh, with the museum project. And uh, you call the last um, project architecture, where someone could even say, well, why? Um, why is, is architecture and is not a geological um, section. Um, however, I do find in both of them, and um, I take these this, this two because they are kind of extremes, but I think all the other projects you show, they fall still um, in between these lines, which um, talk about certain poetics, I think and um, of architecture, of space, of light. And uh, I, I wondered whether you could comment a little bit about mm -hmm. this, it, whether you are, um, um, you do have some um, theoretical research that you're not really telling us <laughs> much yeah. about, or you're searching actually through yeah. this to find um, uh, about, uh, and to talk about certain poetics of space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I, I would say both projects are somehow similar in the sense that they um, kind of insist on the media of architecture, on the space, and they reject certain expectations. If you are invited to competition in China, you are supposed to make an iconographic building, which is an object, you know, which is very special, very fancy, which can be recognized from far away. And we kind of rejected that in the sense that we say, the building is only there to create the space. That's the only purpose. And the same at the Biennale. If you go to the Biennale, 
I would say 95% is not architecture. It's drawing, it's photography, it's video, it's, it's uh, models, it's whatever, but it's not architecture. And even the buildings uh, or the projects that are proposing spaces, they are not real architecture in the sense they are only a symbol for something else. They are an illustration as a photography is an illustration of a space because they say, well, this is the space, let's say, of the Kanzler bungalow in Bonn or this is the space of a drone airport in Africa or this is the space of a housing unit in South America or what have you, you know. So in this sense, they both are like a piece of resistance. Thank you very much. Παρακαλώ παραμείνετε στι θέσει σα γιατί θα ακολουθήσει η βράβευση. Ε, η απονομή βραβείου από το Σύλλογο Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου αποτελεί ύψιστη τιμή σε αρχιτέκτονα ή οποιοδήποτε άλλο μέλο τη πολιτεία μα, αλλά και του ευρύτερου ευρωπαϊκού χώρου, όπου με το έργο και τι ενέργειέ του έχουν συμβάλει ουσιαστικά στην προώθηση και ανάδειξη τη αρχιτεκτονική. Ακολουθεί το σκεπτικό βράβευση του Κριστιαν Κερέ από τον Γενικό Γραμματέα Παναγιώτη Παναγή. Καλησπέρα, καλησπέρα πάλι. Ακολουθεί το σκεπτικό βράβευση. Η ετήσια. Η ετήσια διάλεξη του Συλλόγου Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου, η μνήμη Πάνου Κουλέρμου, φέτο έχει την τιμή να φιλοξενεί τον Ελβετό αρχιτέκτονα Κρίστιαν Κέρε. Ο Κρίστιαν Κέρε είναι απόφοιτο του τμήματο αρχιτεκτονική του Swiss Federal Institute of Technology στη Ζυρίχη. Στη διάρκεια τη καριέρα του έχει ήδη βραβευτεί με πολλά βραβεία. Από πολλού οργανισμού και κέρδισε πολλού διαγωνισμού, ενώ τα έργα του αποτελούν σημεία αναφορά για τη σύγχρονη αρχιτεκτονική. Ο Σύλλογο Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου απονέμει απόψε το ειδικό βραβείο του στη μνήμη Πάνου Κουλέρμου για τη συνολική προσφορά του Κριστιαν Κέρε τόσο στην πρακτική τη αρχιτεκτονική αλλά και στη θεωρητική προσέγγιση συνεισφορά του. Η αρχιτεκτονική του Κριστιαν Κέρε, παραμένοντα απλή, σχεδόν πρωτόλια, δημιουργεί ευρηματικού και ενδιαφέροντε χώρου. Τα κτίρια του, παρότι εύκολα κατανοητά χωρί εξήτηση, διατηρούν αμύωτο το ενδιαφέρον του, αναφερόμενα συνειρμικά σε γλυπτική αφαίρεση. Χαρακτηρίζονται όμω από την ανθρώπινη κλίμακα, στοιχείο που σπάνια συναντά κανεί σε αρχιτέκτονε αυτή τη εμβέλεια, λόγω τη ευαισθησία τη επεξεργασία των εσωτερικών του, που δημιουργούν πολλαπλέ παραστάσει και δυνατότητε οικειοποίηση για του χρήστε. Οι πιο πάνω αναφορέ τον καθιστούν άξιο για το βραβείο, αλλά πιο σημαντικό για μα αναφορά έμπνευση προ αντιμετώπιση πολλών ζητημάτων τη καθημερινή μα πρακτική. Mr. Christian Kerez, for your outstanding performance and excellence in the field of architecture, practice as well as theoretical approach contribution, the Cyprus Architects Association would like to present you with, the, with its 2017 special award. The award will be presented from the president of the Cyprus Architects Association. Κυρίε και κύριοι, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, εδώ ολοκληρώνεται η ετήσια διάλεξη του Συλλόγου Αρχιτεκτών Κύπρου 2017 και σα ευχαριστούμε για την παρουσία σα. Ακολουθεί δεξίωση και παρακαλέστε όπω προσέλθετε στην νότια αίθουσα. Ευχαριστώ.